Well, good afternoon to Dr. everyone, and thank you for attending our panel on <coughs> intercultural and international filmmaking. Uh, the previous channel we have uh, today and yesterday were more about the technical aspects of filmmaking. Today's, uh, or this one, is pretty much about experiences. And for our panel today, we have uh, uh, four people. Uh, the first one is uh, Luca Elmi. You can see their names on the top. Uh, our second uh, panelist is uh, Jorge Hinojosa. Uh, we have also Naomi Kazama. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Anub uh, Kumar here from Cleveland State that probably some of you recognize. Um, the first thing I'm going to be asking uh, each one of you is just to introduce yourself, talk a little bit about yourself, what you do, where you come from, and just brief, okay? Thank you very much. We can start with Luca. I knew it was going to be this way. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. My name is Luca Elmi. I'm from Milan, Italy. I'm 50 years old, which should not be said loud. And I'm a filmmaker. I've been a filmmaker for 30 years. I actually have this sad little story, you know, the sad little kid with the Super 8 camera doing no social life at all and doing stupid little films. Actually, I, I got into first into acting in the theater with a group. And from there I went to, to directing and then uh, producing uh, not long movies, actually I only done shorts because otherwise, you know, they cost too much. And that's more or less it. Okay, well thank you very much. We can continue with the whole part of it. Yeah. <gasps> Jesus. <laughs> yeah, actually these are three shorts I've done. And the incredibly handsome man in the middle is myself. <laughs> Although in the last film I played a corpse, which is my greatest achievement in acting. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Luca, we can continue with Jorge, please. Uh, my name yourself. is George Hinojosa. I have been Ice-T's manager for the last 29 years. And uh, I directed my first documentary, my first movie, uh, last year that premiered at Toronto. And I also produced Ice T's directorial debut that premiered last year at Sundance called The Art of Rap. Uh, I've produced television shows and created television shows and have been around film and TV for a very long time. Um, I also wrote a book that's coming out May 7th, a book of fiction. Uh, and that is my story. Thank you very much, Jorge. Uh, Naomi, please. Yes. Uh, I'm Naomi Kazama from Japan. Actually, I'm a TV director and <coughs> producer in Japan. And uh, this is, do you know what my name is? It's uh, filmed in Cleveland. And uh, this work is uh, my first film. And, uh, uh, what do I say that? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, Actually, I make uh, my program is uh, my TV uh, documentary is uh, broadcast over the 150 countries already, and uh, also that this documentary is I said uh, this is uh, my first film, and uh, we apply the American documentary in, uh, festival in uh, in April, and just uh, four, uh, four days before we got the. Uh, uh, how this audience favorite award. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Naomi. And finally, we continue with uh, Anup. Yeah. Uh, first, to let you know, I'm from the audience. <laughs> I'm from Cleveland State. And uh, my interest in cinema, international cinema, is primarily I research cinema, I study cinema, and uh, my uh, basically looking for how images and stories cross borders and how they change identities, shape identities. And um, so basically my interest is in global cinema and global flow of cinema. Okay, thank you very much. And, and, and yes, I have been associated with the founding of a film festival uh, in 1995. It is still going on, though I have, I'm not currently directly involved with it uh, back in India. Okay, thank you very much. And I'm Professor Medina. I'm also a professor here at Cleveland State. I'm going to be the moderator uh, for today. And the first question, uh, I'm going to be asking uh, four questions uh, to the panelists, and then I'm going to have it open uh, for you to ask questions. And we're going to leave some time at the end for those of you who probably want to have a closer 
uh, conversation with one of our panelists. Uh, our first question is, uh, describe your artistic approach to film and how is this approach different or similar to the more traditional filmmaking? And we start with <laughs> I knew Luca. Uh, approach to filmmaking, that's a, a big thing to explain in a few words. Mm -hmm. What I say is, I, I'm convinced that filmmaking, like book writing, like whatever else you can think about in performing arts, is communication. So for me, is the need to communicate something to the audience. It could be a story. I am a story. I consider myself a storyteller. I also, I, I am a writer too. So I had a couple of books to publish. One of them I turned into my last short film. I would say. I like the classical way of filmmaking. I'm not very much friendly with experimentation, which of course is, here is not like that, but in, in Europe, in Italy especially, just pushed people away from theaters and movie theaters, because usually it's some kind of mental masturbation, sorry, which, you know, is just done for the pleasure of the, the, the performer, not for the pleasure of the audience. So in my case, it's just I saw movies when I was a, a kid. I, my, the best cinema in the world for me is the American cinema. It's the way you know you tell stories, and I think in America the real masters have been born here. I mean, cinema was invented here for me, so I try to stay in a classical way of filmmaking. And actually, there's a very good book written by David Mamet, which I would recommend you to read because it's beautiful. It's called Theater. But it's actually the uh, explains the relationship between actor and director and audience, and in there there's a lot of stuff which is interesting for me because in Italy almost every kind of art, cinema and TV too, are in the hands of the state, which means uh, filmmakers are paid by taxes, and the moment you don't need, you know, to earn your money with audiences, you don't <coughs> care anymore. You just show them whatever you want. And that's the death of art, in my mm. opinion. And that's pretty much what I do, actually. It, I hope I tell stories which can be frightening or funny or sad. Or I don't like much making people think, but I try. <laughs> okay. And that's it. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Luca, the same question for you, Jorge. Uh, you know, it, for me, when I'm, you know, I have a rough outline of, of what I feel like the story is going to be. But I'm open to it changing dramatically because you never know. It's like you, you go on a fishing trip and you never know what you're going to pull up. And if that's something, if, if that is more compelling, then you have to be very confident that that is a much better way to go and be dexterous uh, creatively to be able to follow that path. With my documentary, uh, before I did the interviews, I had a rough idea of what the film was going to be, and it ended up not being that way because the family was so uh, dynamic and it was such an explosive story. And so I was able to kind of uh, retool things and keep a somewhat skeleton of what the original idea was, but accentuate what I knew were the uh, fantastic assets that I um, had uncovered. Uh, you know, I also chose all the music before a frame was shot. Uh, and that's not something that you do with documentaries. You know, I didn't. I knew I wasn't going to have somebody score it or anything like that, and so I chose the music that would kind of guide the tone of it, uh, and that's the way I approached it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jorge and Naomi. Please, the same question for you. I need to uh, so Okay. I will uh, speak in Japanese. えっと、これは初めての私にとってはあの日本語のアニメ、英語の。this is my very first American film, and because of that, uh, she doesn't feel that she can uh, speak too much of the scope of what she has done. なんですが、今回のその映画に関してはその日本のドキュメンタリーとまあやり方と全く違うやり方を考えました。アメリカの she has made this film completely different from the way she would make a Japanese documentary film. The value of making a film in the United States has a different um, kind of connotation as opposed to what would be um, 
what, the same kind of value that they would have in Japan. あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
So this movie was an alternative perspective on telling a story which uh, was uh, thematically at its very foundational level was very similar to the story told by Danny Boyle in Slumdog Millionaire of Mumbai and, uh, and street children and their lives. So, uh, but here we, sa we see a different alternative perspective from on the same film. It's a very interesting for me to look at films telling similar stories, but from different perspectives. And what do they tell us about that? Uh, I have, uh, in, in a way, what's happening is, for me, uh, I, I see that it is, it is bringing world together, but in a different sense now, in the last three, three decades, what we have noticed is this, that we have always talked about how Hollywood movie is going around the world, and there is an Americanization of the world taking place. But in last, especially since 1980s, there is a reversal in trend, and there, is, there are images and stories being told which are moving from east to west, from north, from south to north. And these stories are building what we can, I can say, is some kind of a global culture or what we sometimes describe as a cosmopolitan culture. Uh, and from that point of view, international cinema is important, international flow of cinema is important. Uh, and to some extent, even telling stories uh, for different audiences. For example, I, I, I really found it very interesting what Naomi said, that this was a first film uh, for an American audience made in America uh, from an American perspective. And it would, it would be, she's trying to understand the American perspective, and that's what I get from it, in trying to tell the story which she said that she would not have told in the same sense to an audience back in Japan. And there the logic would have been entirely different. It, so that is kind of an exchange that international cinema uh, makes it possible to some extent. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, was, I was really thrilled at the film festival to see so many people watching international films that the theaters were full. Uh, and uh, to some extent it told me that, you know, I, we often get this uh, truism that Americans don't like to read subtitles. But, <laughs> But there were a lot of people watching the films. It, it's more important that what kind of stories are being told and whether the stories uh, are compelling enough which would attract audiences. It's not the subtitle. We are not that lazy that we will not write, want to read subtitles. We are just looking for better stories. Okay, I guess with uh, the connection uh, you made uh, related to the audience and to the kind of stories we want to present uh, to the audience, we can connect with the next uh, question, which is about uh, what are some of the challenges and satisfactions when you work in the production of an intercultural international film? And again, we start with you, Luca. Well, actually, it being, as you know, I, I can start with a, a quote by Orson Welles, which used to say that, you know, a poet needs a pen, a painter needs a brush, and a filmmaker needs an army, mm -hmm. which means that filmmaking is not cheap costs a lot of money. So the problem is when you, I finance my stuff myself. That's why up to this time I only had short films done. And the moment that you, you do that, uh, besides having sort of a, an intellectual orgasm in doing that, because of course nobody can tell you if something is good or bad, uh, you are the judge, the last uh, uh, person who can say something. The thing is that when you are in this situation, you're not, you know, the big production. So the challenges are everywhere. You have to go. Last time I shot in the center of Milan in, at night, so we had to block the center. So you had to talk to the city. You had to talk to the police. Uh, you had to talk to all these people. And of course, you're nobody in, in their opinion. So uh, the moment that you, you're shooting, actually shooting, every minute costs money, which is your money at, the, at that point. So I always make this sort of comparison is making a film, especially if you've written it, so you see your own stories coming to life, is like uh, having sex with a beautiful woman while you're sitting in a dentist chair having a root canal, which means you experience incredible pleasure, but you know that this pleasure can turn into awful pain at any second. You know, there's, you know, there's some glitch in production, the, the place is not shootable, the, the, the extras are not there, and all that. So the problem is that 
it's actually difficult. Making a film, a real film, a fiction is difficult if you want to do it in a professional way because it, it just, I wouldn't say uh, uh, the first problem is the money. Then comes the rest. I mean, are you any good at it? Maybe you have a lot of money to do a shitty film. So I know. I mean, that just look what's happened in Italy the last 20 years. But the, the problem is that. I mean, it's such a huge task in organization and, and whatever you do. My last crew was 50 people just to shoot something that will never be sold because short films have no market. Just to make sort of a, you know, a personal trip and a, having a, a, a visa card and saying, you know, I can do this. Will anybody give me any money to do something longer? So that's the huge problem. I mean, I produce theater, but theater is usually a lot cheaper, and you make money out of it, because, of course, hopefully people will come and see the show. But doing films is a mess, if you're not into the, you know, into the, into the loop. OK, well, that will answer some later for our last question, but let's continue can you, with can you Jorge. The question for uh, Jorge, is, uh, what are some of the challenges and satisfactions when you work in the production of an intercultural international film? Well, you know, uh, like Luca, I finance, I finance this film myself. And, you know, I look at doing this film as exposing a world to uh, people that they've never seen before. And, you know, whenever you're working with kind of a lot of different people that are not familiar with that world, you want to make sure that the work that they do is in context with what is happening on the screen. And so you've got to have to educate them, uh, and they just can't come in and look at it and, and knock it out. So. My editor, I made sure that he read the book, and, and anybody that was critical in the actual movie, I made sure that they read the book and that they, um, you know, saw all the, you know, specific interviews so that they were educated. And then from that point, um, they had, they were on somewhat even footing with me when it came to the material. Um, you know, I agree with Luca. You know, it, it's um, it's an exercise that's at the same time thrilling and terrifying. You know, and when you have those moments of joy, you know that they're immediately going to be followed by a moment of pain because something got screwed up. So the whole time, you're, you've got your fingers crossed that everything is going to be great, that that interview that came off, the sound's going to be perfect and not have a problem. Because you can't recapture certain moments. That's just the reality of it. So for me, it's, um, uh, you know, I look at myself as a storyteller uh, as well, and I think that all stories are, are very universal. The settings are very unique, though, and those add kind of like a spice and a color to it that uh, can uh, make it not only engaging, but also bring out some of the emotional nuances. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jorge, Naomi, uh, challenges and satisfactions. <laughs> え、はい。あの、例えば私の映画はその高齢者の施設を題材にして、え、1年間と半年間の間、え、10回以上クリーブランドを訪ねて取材をしました。え、she けど、その日本で高齢者の施設を取材する場合に気をつけなきゃいけないことと、その改めてアメリカで高齢者の施設を取材するときに気をつけなきゃいけないということがやはり違っているということに、だんだん取材をやりながらこう気づいていきました。the things that you would have to pay attention to when you would go to a old, an old folks home in Tokyo or in Japan would be considerably different from what you would have to pay attention to when you came here. Over the course of her, uh, her, her coming here, uh, these 10 times, she gradually became accustomed to uh, the things that she would have to pay attention to in an old folks home here in the United States. ただ
それで、まあ、人の中にも入っていけるというかこう、えー、高齢者の人ともだんだんとこう近寄っていけるということを学ぶことができました。Thank you very much.、Uh, I will have to change the question a little bit、uh, for you, and I'm trying to think about our perspective as, as teachers.、Uh, I will think about challenges and satisfactions we, we have with our students when we introduce this kind of film、uh, to them in class. Yeah, that, that becomes the most、uh, interesting part when we、okay. introduce an international film, a film made not an American film, but a film from somewhere else in the world. And then when we talk about how The shoot was, or how would have been, it, it would have been different. I, I sometimes go back to my personal experience. I, I saw the shooting of Avenger in Cleveland and,、uh, and how the location was controlled.、Uh, and I've seen shooting、uh, of films in, back in India where the location is not at all controlled and you, you, you shoot in the chaos simultaneously. Uh, it's not easy to get the city shut down for you, even if you are a big filmmaker. It never happens. All the films that you see shot in a big city like Bombay or Mumbai, they, they never shut down the city. And, and the filmmaker has to negotiate that whole process in many ways.、Uh, so it was, it, it, the challenges are very different in some ways where you can create a controlled environment for your shoot,、uh, whereas in other places where you cannot. And, and those challenges become very interesting. A friend of mine who shoots documentaries、uh, is an American, and he, he was shooting a documentary in India.、Uh, when he shot his first documentary, he really faced a major challenge to negotiate that process. That how do you do that? He would, he would go to the police and he would ask, can I, can I apply for some kind of a permission? They said, don't, nothing exists like this. How would you apply for a permission here to shoot a film? And, and, and then, But then, after doing it once or twice, he, could, he, he realized that, okay, this is, this, this is doable. Only,、uh, it's not,、uh, you have to be appreciative of, the, of your live audiences who are actually watching your shoot at the same time.、Yeah. And so, the, to, to convey these meanings across when we are showing a film to our, to our students and a film is from some other country, and to explain to them the challenges of a filmmaker to shoot that film. In that particular situation, is very different from the way they might have experienced a shoot over here in the US. I want to bring one aspect that you mentioned、uh, before, which is the issue of, of subtitles. Yeah.、Uh, that when you, are, you don't grow up in an environment in which you have to read subtitles because all, all the movies are in your own language,、uh, it's hard to adjust. <laughs> Uh, I, I remember, but、uh, well, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, so I have to read、uh, mm-hmm. subtitles as a kid.、Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm used to it. And in one of the movies I, I went to watch、uh, during this week,、uh, one of the ladies asked me, Can you explain me what happened at the end? Because I was too entertained reading uh, uh, the subtitles and I feel like I missed something. And right, she missed something. It was just a, a, a fast scene that it was crucial to look at. And if you were reading、uh, the subtitle, <laughs> <you're against laughs> the, so, and without that scene, it was very hard to understand the,、uh, uh, the end. So, so, you know, we all will probably have the possibility of watching the movie again, but when you go to a festival, probably that's it. <laughs> yeah, when a movie is only shown at a festival, I think、yeah. I don't know what,、uh, your concerns about having a subtitle and whether people will follow it,、uh, you know, how they're going to be on it, right? <laughs> Same one. Yeah, that's, that always becomes a. T- Because challenge. Though some of my students tell that they do adjust to it very quickly, but in a case of a shot, by the time you adjust it, the movie is over.、Right? <laughs> you lose something. <laughs> you lose something. You're always going to lose something. So、uh, it, is, it is a challenge. So, how do you, how do you kind of think, how do you,、uh, people react? How do, you th- do you think about it when you make the film? Yeah, actually, the problem is if you think it translates well. I mean,、mm-hmm. I do comedies usually, and、oh, I, I never brought. Films here because then you cannot translate them,、mm. and you should see, and you, should, you would have pain if you would watch American sitcom translate. Because in Italy, we dub everything,、mm. so you don't hear one word, you don't、oh. read one subtitle,、so、everything is dubbed.、Mm. And there's a lot of actors that, as a job, do that.、Mm, right. And you should see this stuff, it's unwatchable.、Mm. And you know, sometimes they say, 
I'm going out. And you hear all the public, ha, 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 ha. And you don't, why are they laughing? Because of course, you know, in English there's a joke there. Yeah. But they wouldn't, and you should see what happens in this. I don't know if you ever watched CSI and stuff like that. And there's a shootout with the police and somebody's wounded. Right. And of course they go there and say, he's wounded, call the bus. Which means call the ambulance. Mm -hmm. And people say, you know, his wound called the bus, meaning the bus. <laughs> and because we have two different words in Italian. So it, what, what is he doing? Is he wounded and he's called the, the bus? Is he going somewhere? Is a greyhound? <laughs> so besides the translation and the thing that if you have comedy, if it's word comedy, mm -hmm. joke comedy is almost never translatable. And if you can do it, I mean, in Italy, Woody Allen had a beautiful actor doing his lines, even better than Woody Allen is himself, I would say. But he's an exception, because usually you cannot do that. And if you do subtitles, then, of course, you have to, to translate the joke anyhow. And even worse, because they, they won't watch the face, they won't, they won't understand one thing. So I've never brought a comedy in the States, because it's, it's, you know, unless it's a physical comedy, I don't know, Mel Brooks or stuff like that, you know, where that's cake in the face or, or banana peel or stuff like that. But word comedy, in Italian we say word comedy, I mean comedy based on words, mm -hmm. it's almost untranslatable, almost always. Okay. I was, uh, want to comment? Okay. I, I, uh, I'll never forget, when I was 13 I went to Bolivia where my father is from and my cousins wanted to go see a comedy, a movie. And it was in, uh, I think it was in Italian, and it had four different subtitles <laughs> in different languages along the bottom. I spoke, I spoke none of those languages, so I just had to watch it from a visual standpoint. So, um, you know, I think ultimately, when you when you shoot a movie, you have to think about, does it, you know, can it hold up with the sound off? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so that's my feeling. That's that's hugely true. But somebody said that. I mean, if Especially if it's a, a, a comedy, maybe not, it's a drama or anything else. If it's well, you can read. Enough. You're supposed to be able to read people's emotions. So yeah. when you see somebody talking mm -hmm. to to somebody, and you kind of you can feel their emotions. I mean, you can you can go out in the street and look at somebody from afar and see them having a conversation, and you can tell if it's not going well. And you know that's the importance of a, of a performance, but also uh, in editing. Uh, you know, if you look at the old silent movies, um, they use editing to a great effect, and it was something that was even more important to movies than it is now. So. Okay. Well, I'm gonna go to the la last question that I have, and then I open it to the to the audience. Uh, I know you mentioned some things already, uh, Luca, about it and the difficulty in filmmaking, especially for a short. But since we have student uh, here, I would like to see what kind of advice can you give to students or maybe other people here in the audience uh, who are interested in producing film, uh, films with an intercultural or international scope? Don't do it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> no, I mean do it. There's nothing better in life. Yeah. There's no better job in life yeah. than this one. Whatever you want to do, you want to be an editor, a producer, an actor, a director, a writer, whatever, there's no better job in life. You are the ones who tell story. I, I, I don't know if this has been said somewhere, mm -hmm. but I always thought, you know, in 20 years, I don't know, Korea or somebody will, ex will explode something and we'll all go back to Stone Age. And of course, the, the most important people will be doctors and people who can build stuff. But in the end, at night, we all sit around a fire because there will be no more electricity mm -hmm. and you always will need a storyteller. Somebody, you know, to... I don't even say entertain because entertain is too, is too small of a thing. I mean, we are the one, and I put myself into it because I'm happy with it. We are the one who make people dream. And of course it's documentary, but even documentary, you show something. I saw some of the greatest films I've ever seen are documentaries because you, show, you see something that other people don't and you want to communicate that to, to the audience. And so that's storytelling too, even if it's reality. Maybe even more because it's reality. So do it. I don't know. Be prostitutes if you want, but get the money and do it. Because there's no bigger Russian life than doing that. And I'm free tonight, two hours. Anybody can see that. That's a good segue to me because my film was Iceberg Slam Portrait of a Pimp. So. <laughs> you see? Uh, you know, the way that I look at it is, is that you know, if you if you make it if you make it 
something that is cultural, I think that's a problem. I, you have to make a film that is universal <coughs> and that uh, <coughs> speaks to anybody, regardless if they're young or old or black or white or from any other country. So, you know, uh, just concentrate on making something that's powerful from an emotional standpoint and uh, use the intellect that you've got to punctuate those points. The, the thing for me is, is, you know, whether it's books or, or anything like that, it's always those moments that are an epiphany for the character that are the most powerful. When they have that real transformation uh, and that acknowledgement of something and that understanding of something. So that's what I think is so great. I mean, I've watched a lot of foreign films. I love the French films and the, and the subtlety they have with their endings and the films from South America. And uh, it's always those moments where the person looks up and they've realized something and they've stopped them in their tracks that makes it so powerful. And that's something that everybody around the world can understand because we've all had those moments. Uh, and some of them have been beautiful and some of them have been tragic, but they're moments that we won't soon forget. Okay, thank you. Naomi? She says that they have already said what she was going to say. <laughs> I agree with him. I agree with him. <laughs> yeah. See, intellectual, intercultural, but same language. <laughs> She says being able to meet all of these um, uh, international uh, people and seeing international films and being able to uh, uh, participate in this, um, in this event uh, it has made her very happy. あの、<笑> Uh, she's making this, uh, this film and um, having the interaction with these elderly people. She felt initially she would not be able to communicate with them. Her, she says her English is not so good and uh, that was a worry for her. But as the time progressed, she was able to have a communication with these uh, elderly people at the old folks home. <laughs> Even though some of these uh, people were in rather egregious conditions and Alzheimer's, I think we can agree, is an egregious condition, uh, they, they were very warm towards her. Uh, doing this kind of um, a documentary and being able to go uh, to international countries uh, and, and maybe like, get the message out uh, is a very important uh, idea for her. Yeah. And that's all. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Anu, please, advice. Well, my, my, first, my first advice is always watch a lot of, a lot of movies. Yeah. Uh, before you make movies, watch lots and lots of movies. Whenever you get an opportunity to see a movie, just watch it, uh, even if it's from other cultures, other countries, because that is what builds your um, appreciation for cinema. It also builds your um, various ways in which narratives, stories can be told, and that helps a lot. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I would I would say that. Uh, in my studies of cinema, I've always found that a thick description in a particular story always has uh, a universal element in it. So here you can bring the particular and the universal together. When you tell a very thickly described particular story, you will find the universal themes emerge from it, which others can also understand and also appreciate. So. Uh, Shying away from telling a very, very particular story 
uh, you should never do that. If, if you can tell a very part particular story in depth, you should attempt that because that would that would have an universal element in it, uh, and that's where watching a lot of films with, with becomes the first preparation to become a filmmaker. Okay, thank you very much. I, I when Luca was, was talking, uh, an image came to me that. Uh, after you do all your work of the day and then you go back to your house and your fireplace or whatever, uh, a movie is, is, is going to be is going to be there. And, and what I thought about was uh, when I watched the movie Wally, uh, that is just the end of the world practically. Everything has disappeared. He has to collect things, but at the end, he has his movie that he can mm -hmm. watch and feel satisfied and enjoy. And that's almost like a gem that that he was able to. Uh, to yeah. keep, so it was uh, interesting to, to connect and maybe make us think about that, about the importance, about the satisfaction uh, of film and the good work. Uh, I'm just going to open now for questions uh, for the audience. I just want to be very concrete with your questions, direct questions, and... Uh, You're such a teacher. <laughs> I am a teacher and I'm a control freak. Uh, so if I have to stop you, I'll do it. Uh -huh. First. Well, I mean, as far as Cuba goes, I mean, there's cultural things that you can go there. And it's very easy to go to Cuba. You can fly to Mexico, and you fly from Mexico to Cuba, and they don't stamp your passport and all that other stuff. So from that aspect, I said that that's, that's not an issue. The, the second thing is, is, as far as, you know, who you are physically and what you represent, you know, I don't think that really much matters. I think, if anything, that probably gives you more respect from people because they know that you want to educate yourself and you want to tell a story that you find interesting, but yet you're not part of that specific culture. Um, and the bottom line is, is that if you know your stuff really well, then that's really that all that matters. It's like, you know, the, the person that is the foremost uh, authority uh, on, like, the African culture might be a white Jewish guy. You know, if you know your stuff, you know your stuff. And so, uh, and people recognize, people recognize that. So, I mean, my movie was about a uh, pamphlet, you know, that was born in 1918. And, you know, that's not where I come from. The book that I wrote was set in the Bronx and it's black street lit. And the thing is, is that I know that stuff because I've been managing ICE for a long time. And I've been with him and experienced his culture up close and personal. And my perspective is unique, other, you know, because I am not from that world. And so for me, I see the nuances that are surprising and that are interesting and that are different from the rest of the world. And that's what you will see as well. And to accentuate that is important. And another filmmaker from that world may not see the relevance in that. Okay. But also, too, your marketing. Do you market more to us because it's about a black film? Well, I market, I market to, to um, different groups. You know, his books are taught in, by a lot of professors in schools because it is so unique and dynamic. And so I push it towards the college campuses uh, in that respect. But I also uh, have very specific urban marketing as well. So it's kind of like I see it as two groups. 
You know, there are people that are fascinated with pimping because they just don't understand it, and culturally it's so far withdrawn from that. Whereas the black community, it's not. Uh, and so your marketing push to them uh, in the colleges and the urban community are two different kind of market pushes. And so I do, you know, simultaneous, and I know from that a larger eminent, uh, a larger audience that uh, satellites around it will get introduced to the film. Okay, thank you very much. Over here. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have, I think, two comments, and then I'll ask a general question. Um, I really appreciate, I think, the comment that you made, Mr. Nosa, that would your um, film stand up visually? And it relates to another thing um, that all of you have touched upon, and it's a media effect issue, and you guys will get it. I'm not going to go into that because I'm not. <coughs> Like Stalin said, that um, film is the one of the most important parts, and it's because it has such wide-ranging media effects. People interpret it, and it's about the. For me, I understand that it's about the artist knowing his tool, and like you said about the comedy, you would dare not make the comedy be exported to another country because the verbals would not stand mm -hmm. up. But if the imagery, if you're a filmmaker, you have to understand that your tool is the visual image. It's not the words. It's not the music. So you have to make it so it stands up visually. And if you make a visual, artistic statement, it will stand up cross-culturally. It's because it's visual. It can spark that emotional response to the message you're trying to get across. That's my comment. The question is, um, and I'll make it specific so that other people can ask, but I've had a different one for you, but I asked you afterward. And for you, Mr. Hinosa, when you were doing The Peacemaker, now if we think of um, filmmakers as pretty safe and secure, and kind of a like, cushy job, but you were doing this peacemaker, and it's a documentary style mm -hmm. film, so you had to be in that urban environment, negotiating that urban territory while you're trying to make your film. Did you ever run across any issues where you actually felt threatened, damaged, scared, you know, and how did you negotiate that traffic? And did you choose to for the sake of your film, or for the sake of money, or the, for the sake of the story? Um, every day. It was, it was, um, the most terrifying experience I've ever had. The, the Peacemaker was a, a, a six episode uh, reality show about a guy named Malik Spellman who uh, mediated differences between gangs that were killing each other. So you would have the Fortres and um, you, know, you would have like these, these Crip gangs that were <coughs> killing each other. Something would happen where somebody gets shot and then you bring these guys together and mediate an understanding. The first day of filming, um, uh, the whole crew quit. <laughs> you were in LA? <laughs> yeah, the whole crew quit. Wow. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. And it's like, in the middle of the day, they tried to quit. And I'm like, look, uh, you, if you quit, I guarantee you there will be violence against you, and it'll be from me. So you're not going to quit. Okay? And so, you know, for me, I've always been able to communicate um, with that element. I mean, Ice-T came from that element. And so I had that pedigree where they knew I managed Ice-T. And the thing is, is that I played it straight with them. We had a situation where uh, the eight Trey Broadways came in and said, we need to be a part of this television episode. And I said, look, this is the reality, what's going to happen. I'm either gonna shut down production, there's not gonna be any television show, or you're gonna agree to let us film and then what I will do is, is that I will work with you to incorporate you into another episode that's specifically about you. And so I would rather do that because I'm looking for volunteers to do this because a lot of people don't want to meet with their enemies. And so if you're down with that, then that's great for me. But it's one of those two. And there's not going to be a combination of those two or anything. I'm going to give you 200 bucks and this needs to be clear. And they were like, okay, cool. And I was like, that's great. Now you need to make sure that all your people know that that's what's going on. And, you know, I just played it straight, and there were times when I didn't know if we were gonna get shot. And, you know, we passed one girl on the street where she had been murdered, and there was blood all over the place. And we're dealing with kids that are living in this environment. And it's extremely violent. And I have a daughter, and I'm a soul, my, my, uh, my daughter's mother died. And so I am the sole source of everything for her. And, you know, I looked at the situation as I'm kind of halfway into it, and I'm thinking, is it responsible for me to be here telling these stories that I feel are going to have a greater good and maybe start an epidemic of peace? And I thought to myself, well, if I don't, who will? 
Who's going to take this chance? And the thing is, it's like, I might be saving my own life one day. Because the thing is, if I get these guys to come together and stop doing this, who knows what path they're going to take? We're all connected. So it was. It was very scary and it was very terrifying. And I had a very hard time sleeping. And after we shot the last episode, I was incredibly relieved. The network and the production company were so afraid that they refused to put any of their credits on the screen. And the only people that had credits on the screen were myself and Ice. And, you know, because I was proud of it and I believed in what I was doing. And, you know what, you can't have fear in this business. You have to go out and you have to go for it because you're risking, you know, your emotions and your physical safety a lot of times to get what you want to do. Now there's a difference between being foolish. There's one person on the crew that says, well what if we give them fake guns and we say, you know what, we're going to go kill those people. It's like, no. No, because the thing is, it's like if we show that, it might be good television, but after we're done, there's repercussions from that. So, yeah, I'm going to have nightmares tonight. Thanks for that. <laughs> Anybody else on the panel wanted to comment on that? Or if not, I go okay, for another I other question. Let me, let me go for another question. Because it's, uh -huh. Over there. Um, first, speaking with Mr. Alfie and Ms. Kazuma, when you make films in your native language and you go and you take that films to an international market or an international audience, how much do you pay attention to the translation, uh, like the subtitles of your films when they're showing like here in Cleveland? In my case, actually, depends <laughs> depends on how the film. One of them, uh, I really there was no time, so I couldn't even check the translation because we were out of time. The last one, I did it myself. Mm -hmm. I checked it myself, mm -hmm. and all the same does mistakes. But you know, as I said, it's a, it's a drama, so it's a linear. Uh, conversation, so it's much less difficult than a comedy uh, translation. So in my case, we should be sure that at least the subtitles are done well. Uh, in this, in her case, the uh, actual film was done in English. So there would be no uh, need for subtitles in English. However, when this film is shown back in Japan, she's going to have to make the subtitles in Japanese. So I あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あの、あ
So if you do it right, uh, from Japan to India to Africa to America, it shouldn't be it shouldn't be about you know uh, uh, making one culture like another, but just watching what happens. I mean, I'm I'm I will depict what is back home, what's reality for me, but I will enjoy any other kind of reality if it's well done. So that's why I mean we are filled with American films and TV and they're beautiful films and huge beautiful shows and of course they're American that's one of the good stuff I mean if I do and uh, which I hope I'm, I'm going to do a TV show in Italy which will sell to America it should be a human story so that he, everybody should understand it of course the frame will be you know I don't know the Colosseum in Rome or whatever but the story is always the same I think there's not much difference Sometimes we think about the term globalization in a, in a bad way, probably that, that's what it is, but when we think about literature, you know, what is the good, the good literature? The literature that is universal, that have been able to be preserved for many years and it can be understood by people in different, uh, in different places. So that, that, I guess that, that applied to it, but it's just that the globalization term sometimes is, it have a, a connotation that makes some people uncomfortable <laughs> yeah, in some aspects. Yeah, and art's going to evolve to be what it wants to be anyway. You're going to have artists that are going to totally disregard the mm -hmm. normal storytelling procedures and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and they're going to do what they want to do simply because they want to see something different. So, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Um, you want to comment well, something about I, it? I, yeah, I wanted to say something about uh, uh, the question that Americanization argument uh, mm -hmm. which is which is there which is about if you look at the global global trade on cinema uh, obviously America Hollywood dominates that uh, but then that's the case with every other industry you know it's 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 the domination of the econ of the economic side of it uh, but the good thing has what has happened in last mm, three decades as I was talking about earlier is like rest of the world has also economically grown and there has been developed. So you have now more flow from both sides. And that fear, the earlier fear of Americanization was there, both in, not only in the developing world, but even in Europe for that matter, where they were concerned that we, we will lose our own filmmakers and our own industry. That has in many ways dissipated to a large extent because of this, this international global flow and the possibilities of a filmmaker who's making a film in Japan to show it in the 150 countries, mm -hmm. or for that matter, a filmmaker from Puerto Rico or any small, uh, even a small island country can making a film and being able to, because the mechanism exists. And film festivals like this play a big role in providing that platform, you know, exposing to all of us for films from very countries that we might have not even heard name of, you know, and that's, so that, that process, that, that argument has almost been defeated to some extent or lost its value it, uh, that it had in 1970s or 60s when we talked about Americanization uh, in, in international cinema. There was one question in the back? I have a question. Oh, oh okay. Okay, I have a question. Um, I and it goes back to the uh, follow-up. Did you want to? I'll, I'll, I'll wait for that. No, no, it's fine. It's so that I saw another hand, but. And it was, about, it was about the, uh, it was about the uh, statement about um, the Wally and the film mm -hmm. at the end of the world and everything. Mm -hmm. and, and it fits with the uh, documentary thing mm -hmm. because the term documentary is that you're documenting something. And the longest tradition of story and history and passing on to other generations is the story, and whether it's told verbally, visually, or whatever. So that's why that's important. The specific question is for um, Mr. Elmy here. When you mentioned that in Italy the films are financed by the government, but that you're pretty consistent with um, doing your own shorts because you finance your own film, the question is twofold. Do you do that primarily because you want to maintain control? Because if you're using your own money, you can control what you produce. And that is the second question. Because the government subsidizes or pays for the films, they not necessarily censor, but do they um, put limitations or restrictions or imp or stronger influence on the content than you want to put up with? Actually, what happens is that if you are a filmmaker and you want to do a film, uh, you write a script and you present it to a commission, and this commission will read it and say, okay, this is going to be a 
socially you know, uh, good movie, and it will give you up to 80% of the production cost. The thing is that practically everybody who presents the script gets financed, and of course you get financed mostly if you have, uh, if you belong to a certain political um, uh, point of view, let's say, which is not my own, and you know, it just makes me puke when I... And of course what happens is that every moron that goes there and gets the money, he says, you know, my film will cost 10 million, they will give him an eight, he will spend two, making a shitty movie, and with the other six he will go and have a vacation in Florida, I don't know. The, the thing is that I'm convinced that uh, as I go back again because I love him and I think he's one of the greatest filmmakers that you have today, uh, to David Mamet, what he said, actually he was talking about the actor studio and the Stanislavski method, and why this came from Russia is because back then the, uh, the state would finance every kind of theater uh, uh, so that the actors would never wonder about the public, the audience, because they were paid already. So one people in the audience, one person in the audience, or, or theater full, for them was the same. And so what happened is that it started looking inside instead of looking outside at the audience. And from there came, actually he says, came this philosophy of the, you know, the magical self and the actor studio, Stanislavski method, which is good. I mean, it, it, don't take me wrong, this part is good. But what happens if you go on like this is that once they say, I like, I don't know, Mao Zedong or, or, or whatever, and I have a piece of crap and you will pay me to do that, what happens then is, have you ever seen an Italian, a good Italian film in the last 15 years, 15 to 20? I mean, we are, I, I, I don't talk about now, but we had Fellini and Visconti and Rossellini and Tognoni and all these people. So we did something good, not much, but something good. Have you ever seen a good Italian film in the last 15 to 20 years? Apart a couple of Oscar winners? I mean, if I say La Strada, does it ring a bell? No, stuff of the 50s or the 60s. Have you ever seen something good coming out of this shithole that is now <laughs> the film production in Italy? And you should see the actors because they're shitty writers, but you should see the actors, my friend. And I won't mention names, but a couple of them have done work here, which I saw, and my God, <laughs> uh, it's really sad. There's no acting school anymore. Now they do some kind of reality show you know, on TV, and then they go directly on stage or in the film, and of course they can't act. They, are, they have no idea. We have dictions. There's, there's things that you need to learn in order to be an actor. It's not only talent natural talent, and that's what happens when state pays for art. Art goes to hell. So that's my personal opinion. I mean, it's right, you know, starving artists should be financed, but not to this extent, because otherwise, that's what happens. Sad but true. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Or do you get concerned about cultural offensiveness, meaning that what works for one group may not work for another? Like, do you have to find this, or do I have to censor this? Because for in this area, everybody's okay with it, you know what I'm saying? But somebody from another, you're presenting this to another audience, and it's like, that's not cool. You know what I'm saying? Do you worry about that? Do you find yourself having to, you know, censor yourself or read? explain why you're doing what you're doing or why that's the way it is like you have to put a, like a, a disclosure or something out there uh, in my opinion humor good humor uh, should be it's not good taste because of course lots of beautiful jokes are in very bad taste but that's the good of it <laughs> I mean depends on depends a lot I, I heard you have a, a, a stand-up comedian woman called Joan Rivers here. <laughs> uh, and I saw she did, recently there was some kind of an HBO or something, and she did a show, and at some point she made a joke, a, very, a, very, a joke in very bad taste about deaf people. And somebody in the audience, you know, screamed something, and <laughs> she answered saying that her own brother or son or whatever was deaf. 
And so why be, be angry about this? And I'm not, I mean, I think that there's a, a line in humor. And whatever is the audience, of course, you, certain things are, you can do, always. And certain things you should never do. That's my personal opinion. And which one are one, I mean, that depends on what you're doing, but I mean, you should never make fun of certain things. Because there's a sort of line, which usually is called good taste, but that's not the word. I mean, it's called humanity. Well, I mean, but do you like, do a research? Like, if you're taking this project to another environment, do you research them with that environment to find out? I would do that, depending on where. I mean, I don't see a place, of course, if you make fun of, of something really, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about India now that, you know, is that true cows are sacred animals. So if you make a joke about that, you would be to, to, to be very careful about that. Because when you touch religion and, and you know, faith and all this stuff, it, it shouldn't, I don't know if you're allowed to do that, but you have to be very careful about what to do. But of course, you should make research if you're going to certain countries where these things happen. I, I, I don't have a better example that comes to mind right now. And there are some places that they're that you're just you're never going to get play anyway. Like the Middle East has got oh, yeah, so many strict things that they feel about that even just showing a woman in a bikini is going to be offensive to them. So that's why I've, I I represented these two Iranian DJs named Deep Dish who were very popular, and I saw a couple of Iranian films I thought were great, and they said the only films that get made in Iran are, are about kids. Because you know what, those are the ones that you know the censors allow to play, and that aren't de are, that aren't deemed offensive or political. Um, so it's That's a shame. So sad. Would you present a challenge for the movies for, uh, for us as professors, the movies that we select to present in the classroom? Sometimes we have to think and, and look at the movie and make sure that our audience is not going to be. Uh, offended uh, with, with the topic. Uh, I remember going once to the movies, uh, watching a Colombian movie, and they were showing uh, uh, killing an animal. And I don't know how many people stand up and left, but, but, but upset. But this is the same kind of audience that they can watch a very violent American movie and won't care. So, so, but I understand the sensibility to our animals in this culture is extremely high. Uh, compared to, to others. That's, that could be for example, an, an example of, of how, what could be uh, offensive. Yeah, to, but also, don't you have to worry about that truth? I mean, if that's what it is, it's what it is. And that's, that, that, that's why another question I guess I have to ask is like, if this is what it is, and this is part of, if, if it has to relate to that story. Mm -hmm. how, yeah, people are going to be offended no matter what. I mean, I yeah. just, I recently okay. played my film at the Dallas International Film Festival. And I'm, as I'm sitting on the tarmac to fly out there, I get an email from the head of the festival saying, please look at this email that I got. You know, how should I respond? And it was a woman that dealt with women that had been uh, enslaved and prostitution and so on and so forth. And she wanted the film pulled from the festival. And so I called her up and I said, look, you know, um, I'm the father of an 11-year-old daughter who I raised solely. And I would never put anything out into the world that would you know, uh, you know, promote the prostitution of women or the degradation of women? You need to see this film before you make these kind of judgments. And she came and she saw it. She was the first person to raise her hand and said that she loves it and she thought it was really brilliant and gave her a whole new perspective and so on and so forth. So, you know, you 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 are going to offend some people, and there are certain things that you should do to kind of shake people up and wake them up so that they really pay close attention. So. And I guess in a way this is related to this subject, I guess maybe putting the issue on the other foot. Uh, have you found, and what do you do about this, where not so much the audience might be offended, but the filmmaker is offended? That is, are you in, how activist do you feel you must be if you are in a situation which is offensive to you. Um, do you feel, do you ever have to walk the tightrope where you feel you need to intervene 
to do something positive for that situation? Or do you just, is it more your <coughs> obligation as a storyteller to tell it like it is without the thought of intervention? Right. I think that by telling make, it, by telling it. make something better. Right. I think by telling it the way that it is, you educate people, and I think people's natural sensibilities is positive, and that is a catalyst for change. You know, with my movie, I showed his life and how it was a life of transformation and redemption. And as a result, you know, people kind of understood him and realized that, you know what, his books were cautionary tales, and it was, he was actually a very positive figure in society now. With The Peacemaker, you know, I showed how these gangs had such animosity and hatred for each other, uh, but I also showed how they were fathers and how they loved their kids and how they suffered real pain and how they were put in this pressure cooker of, you know, uh, racism and uh, horrible economics and horrible food and, you know, broken families. And I think that education makes people look at their plight a little bit different as opposed to looking at them as just being ignorant mm -hmm. and stupid. You know, when we're under duress, we do things that, you know, are not really fully thought out. I still have this, I still have this very vivid photograph in my mind <coughs> of the um, situation in, in Vietnam where the photographer shot the exact moment mm -hmm. of somebody getting his head blown out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just imprinted on my, in my head. Was it his... Could he have done anything to prevent that? You know, the, the thing is, is like, ultimately, in, in that isolated circumstances, he probably could have. But in a greater circumstance that created that situation, no. And so the most powerful thing that you can do is, you know, honestly, try to save um, as many people as you possibly can, as opposed to the individual, which is a very kind of Buddhist mentality. Um, I had asked a Buddhist monk about that uh, and you know I think you have to look at the greater good and you you have to look at what you can do to make a huge impact to change the way people think I can appreciate that position too. but it is it difficult you from the, it is difficult it, it, yeah it you from a like a quote's objective someone yeah. to, to possibly a propagandist or a yeah. I mean, who wouldn't want to save uh, the individual? Everybody. Everybody would. But, you know, by doing that image, it enlightened people to the horror of what was going on and made, you know, the sentiment in America even more stronger to stop those atrocities. And um, that's kind of the way it is. Yeah, if you just want more no, comment. No, across. Yeah. no, I'm just trying to ask a question across in the panel. Uh, to Naomi, I wanted to know what did what brought you to that topic that you wanted to do a documentary mm -hmm. on old folks' home in the United States, and how was it like? Did you learn something different from back your experience in Japan, mm -hmm. an old folks' home in Japan, something which uh, mm -hmm. you know, epiphanic mo moment that was being suggested? What was that? Uh, actually, that. Um I was making a TV program about brain science with uh, Dr. Ryuta Kawashima. Dr. Ryuta Kawashima uh, invented uh, this, uh, actually, the uh, Elijah Jennings, uh, Elijah <laughs> Dr. Ryuta Kawashima, uh, she was doing this program about uh, Dr. Kawashima, yeah. Dr. Kawashima uh, who had developed a methodology for uh, helping Alzheimer's patients regain uh, re re regain some of their life back. それが日本では大変効果を上げてるんですが、今回海外で初めてえっとまあトライアルが実際あの実践されるっていうことがあったので、その効果というかを過程を見たいなというふうに思いました。uh, the um, effectiveness of the method was very uh, positive in Japan, and they wanted to try it. They wanted to have a trial in the United States to see if it would be as effective. Mm -hmm. The same methodology. あの、アルツハイマーというのは世界的に共通の問題ですし、何かこう新しいノンドラッグの、あ、
。ランニングセラピーというのはドラッグは使わないんですね。ノンドラッグセラピーなんですね。Is she saying that the, this,、uh, it, this methodology that the doctor had developed is a non-drug therapy?、Mm-hmm. So it's non-pharmaceutical?、Mm-hmm. And... そのまあ、トライアルを追う過程もそうなんですけれども、その世界の人がどういうふうにアルツハイマーを今、あのアルツハイマーと今直面しているか、今どういうふうな形で問題視を抱えているかということをあの見たいなというふうに思ったので、ドキュメントを使いました。And she wanted to know what, the,、um, what people were thinking worldwide about、uh, Alzheimer's and if the, the, maybe if this methodology would work with m o v i o k a y well, I want to thank all the members in the panel、uh, for today for the participation.、Uh, Thank our interpreter for today, which is our Japanese、uh, instructor for the Department of Modern、uh, Languages. We still have some time.、Uh, you can approach. I know some people prefer to talk directly、uh, to the person, so we still have like 10 minutes that you can hang out and talk to the people who are here. And thank you for the audience for your participation as well. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming.